The title of this week's Torah portion is Mishpatim, and it's translated as Judgments. And if, if you've read the Torah portion, if you've kind of been following along, it's, it was interesting to me because Mishpatim seems to do a complete reverse of the style and everything that's been taking place up to this point. And we find that Mishpatim almost reads as if it's from the middle of the book of Leviticus. It's a bunch of laws, a bunch of do's and don'ts. And this is on the heels of everything that just took place in the previous portion, the majesty that's displayed at Sinai. And so you go from Yahweh speaking and revealing himself and all of his glory to all of a sudden this Torah portion seems to just, just screech to a halt. By the way, here's 53 random laws. <laughs> and yet we know that Yahweh doesn't do anything by accident. So there's a purpose. There's a reason. Why are these here? This Torah portion is often referred to as the Sefer Habrit, the book of the covenant. And we find that it concludes the official covenant cutting ceremony at Mount Sinai. And there's a verse that actually states that Moshe is commanded to read what is referred to as the book of the covenant, the Sefer Habrit. And most will acknowledge it seems as if this book of the covenant is these very laws that are about to be detailed. And as we said, it's interesting because there's a complete shift in the flavor, if you will, in the style when we come to this week's Torah portion. 53 different commands are seen listed, and yet it was exciting to me because I had started working on these notes previous to Shepherd John sharing, and when he began to share some things last week, it just was a perfect segue into this week, Lower, because how many of you realize that even here, in the midst of what's taking place, you'll find that the significance is still being focused on Israel's willingness to hear. Pastor Shepherd John expounded upon this last week. It was all about Israel's ability to hear the voice. Well, this week we find it's continuing on. This whole ceremony that's taking place at Sinai is all about Israel learning to hear the voice. If they will hear the voice, if they will be obedient to that voice. And we find that it almost seems as if it's a repetition of the call that went forth in the Garden of Eden. Where are you? The voice is on the mountain, and we, it seems that the question's being asked, where are you? Yes, we know physically the nation of Israel, they're standing here at the base of the mountain, but where are you? Are they really here to once again walk with and be one with the voice? Now, when we look at these 53 commandments, it's interesting because he chooses specifically 53 to list here as part of the covenant cutting ceremony. How many of you realize there's 613 total laws, total commandments? He addresses the 10 last week, but now he adds another 53 that seem to be so significant that these must be outlaid and agreed to before we can proceed further in this relationship. Well, how many realize that nothing is by accident? The number 53, we're going to look at this because it literally begins to lay the foundation for what's taking place in this Torah portion. 53 is the value of several interesting Hebrew terms. It's the value of the term Eben, stones, as well as the term Oben, which is literally a branch off of the word meaning stones. But this, the Oben specifically describes a potter's wheel or birthing stones or a birth stool. And so when we see this, as he begins to declare these 53 commandments that Israel must agree to, these 53 mishpatim, before the ceremony can be ratified, before the covenant can be truly agreed to, it seems as if they've actually been brought to the place of the birthing stones. The birth stool, the potter's wheel, this is where they're at. It's no accident Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb is where they are. It's the potter's wheel, it's the birthing stones. Well, this term Eben comes from the root word banan. It means to build, to rebuild, establish, or cause to continue. And it infers to build a house, to establish a family. But we find that all of these terms, Eben, the stones, bana, to build, all of them have this two-letter root, which forms the word for sons. He's brought them here to become, to be built, and to be established as banim, as sons and daughters of the kingdom. It also seems to infer that before they got to this point, before they're here at this place, they're Israel, they've been redeemed, they've been brought out, but they're not sons until we get here to this point. 
And it's quite interesting because the same letters, as well as you continue to look at this value, 53, 53, Mishpatim, 53 commandments, the same value, 53, as well as the same letters that form Eben, stones, rearranged form the Hebrew word Nava. And it means to prophesy, to cause to bubble up, to pour out or to pour forth abundantly. And so when we see this, we have to ask the question, could these mishpatim spoken to Israel actually be designed to prophesy over the living stones that have been gathered? They've been brought here, these stones to be built up, to be established, to be transformed. Literally, these stones have been gathered at the mountain to be born again. Do you realize that when the Mashiach makes these statements, this was something he's referring back to what was the intention all along with Israel. They were brought to Sinai to be born again. They were brought to the place of the birthing stones to be shaped, to be formed by the potter in order so that at this point forward, now they would be seen as sons and daughters. Now they would be seen as capable of accessing an inheritance that the father had for them in the land. Without this experience, they cannot enter the land. Without this experience, they cannot be classified or seen walking in the authority of sons and daughters. And so it seems as these words that are going forth, it's literally a prophetic word that's being spoken over them that has the potential to change the course of their very destiny and who they are. How many realize this is still the purpose of the words of the Torah? If we ever remove that and it just becomes words upon a page, it just becomes this rote religious exercise that we do. How many realize that we've completely removed ourselves from the very intention of Yahweh in giving us the Torah? It should be a prophetic word spoken into your life that has the potential to change you and transform you every time you hear it, every time you have that encounter with it. Amen? So it seems if, as we look at this, if Israel is unable to hear these words, because how many realize that the Messiah spends a lot of time talking about those that have ears to hear, let them hear. Well, we understand that physically everyone has ears, but it seems that the Messiah seems to point out a very particular problem with, the most, peop- with most people. They have physical ears, but they don't hear. They don't listen. And so we find that as Israel is brought here, it seems to be emphasizing the point, Israel, you must listen to these words that are about to be prophetically spoken over you because if you don't listen to the words, if you you have ears but you do not hear, then you will not be established, transformed. You literally won't be born again. You remain in a dead state. And it seems that it's only by being placed upon the birthing stones will they live again. And how many realize this actually becomes a prophetic shadow picture of what's happening right now because he's gathering the exiles again. You're being called from the four corners of the earth and there's a prophetic word of the Torah that's going forth. But depending on how we hear, depending on if we choose to hear, determines whether we remain dead and lifeless or whether we live again. It's only by hearing the words, by coming to the place of the potter's will, will Israel live again. Can these bones live again? It's the same shadow picture I believe that Ezekiel sees. What is standing here at the foot of Mount Sinai is a valley of dry bones. They've been dead and lifeless in Egypt. There's no life in them, but they've been brought here to Nevah to be prophesied over to live again, but they must have ears to hear. Amen? But this begs a closer look to what's taking place on these stones. What happens on the birthing stones? What happens on the potter's wheel? What would prevent Israel from hearing? Because it seems as if right now, well, of course we want to hear. Yes, let's hear. Of course I want to live. Of course I want to be a son or a daughter. And as we continue to look at this, we find that there's some forming, some shaping, some friction, some some rubbing the wrong way, so to speak, that takes place on the potter's wheel. Now, when we look closer at the Hebrew term for prophecy or to prophesy, nava, which is what's taking place here, it's interesting because the noon bait root stem indicates the seed within or inside. Noon is the seed, bait literally means within. In other words, as Israel hears these words spoken or prophesied over them, these words that are going forth are going to cause the seed that's within their hearts to now come forth and be revealed. 
In other words, these words will reveal and expose the heart of Israel. How many of you realize that a true prophetic word will cause the heart of a person or even a nation to be revealed? Why? Because it's only when all of this that's been hidden deep down is brought to the surface that now there can be this circumcision that takes place and the things that do not belong are removed in order for them to make true teshuvah. How many realize that this is why when you have an individual who intrudes into this role, the role of the prophet or chooses to usurp this role, it's extremely dangerous. Why? Because those words also, they're seed. Whether they're from Yahweh or not, it, whether it's a false prophetic word or not, it's still seed. And it causes something to be brought forth, but it's with disastrous results, and it's not with restoration. And so we find that this is something quite needful. Israel's gathered here to receive this prophetic word. And as these words go forth, it's actually going to cause the heart of Israel to be, to literally be revealed and opened up and laid before the creator. Why? Israel has just exited Egypt. In order to be truly free of Egypt, any remnants of a seed within must be dealt with. I mean, realize that if they leave the obin, if they leave the potter's wood, if they leave the birthing stones, having not allowed Yahweh to do the work of the potter of removing these things that don't belong, if the corruption of Egypt is able to still be housed within them, then when they leave this potter's wood and they live again, so does Egypt. Egypt lives again as well. It finds new life in them. They literally become a GMO unholy mixture. Because whatever is within is now breathed life into it. And so now you can understand why sometimes throughout our own experiences and throughout when Yeshua is speaking to the people and here Yahweh is speaking to Israel, why there could be a tendency to not hear. Because in order to hear, I have to undergo this process where I will allow him to remove anything that is not of him. And it can be painful and it can be this excavation that takes place within the spirit man. And yet this is necessary to become sons and daughters. In fact, this same root stem, this noon bait root stem can indicate to hollow out or to bore out. It would seem then that there's a great significance being placed on removing or literally emptying out Israel, emptying out the remnants of Egypt. We have to ask, well, what's the danger if they don't? Well, remember, this sets a precedent and a pattern for our own exodus. What happens if we come out of Babylon, yet we don't deal with the remnants that are left within our own spirit, in our own minds, things that have shaped us, things that we've been involved in, that at the time it doesn't seem significant, but now as we're on the potter's wheel and that breath is about to be breathed on us, what is it that we're about to give life to? What is it that's about to live again? We give life to it again, and we find that if there's anything that is contrary to the word of Yahweh, then we've just birthed a generational curse. We give life to the very things that will eventually enslave us again. And now you can understand why Israel's brought here. It's the potter's will. Things have to be removed. Some things have to be taken care of. This is like it's housekeeping in the midst of this Torah portion. And yet it's powerful because Yahweh's promising them that you're going to live again. I'm going to cause you to be made and transformed into my sons and daughters. But this process is necessary. There must be this emptying out of Israel. And it seems then as Israel stands here, it's a separation of the seed lines again. How many realize that this is what Yahweh is in the business of from the very beginning? He is consistently separating and making sure that this doesn't get contaminated. He separates the seed lines. We find that Jacob does the same thing when he leaves the house of Laban. He separates his flock from that of Laban's. He makes a distinguishing factor between the two. When Israel is in Egypt, Yahweh already begins this process. He separates his people from the Egyptians. And yet now we find that he separated them in this manner. But now here, as they stand at Sinai, now he must go and do the inward work. He must separate, once again, Egypt from Israel within the very heart of Israel. It's as if he's repairing and restoring the DNA of Israel on the very molecular level of what makes them who they are, he's repairing and restoring. Now, that's a very powerful concept because how many realize that we currently live in days where not only spiritually can you be contaminated and disruptive 
in your mind and in your spirit, but now physically you can be assaulted as well. And how many of us, when we arrive at Sinai, who knows what experiences, what we've endured and been through in order to come here that would be corrupt and wrong within these physical bodies. And yet he's telling you that when you hear the Nava, when you hear the words prophesied over you, he's literally opening up and stretching out that DNA strand and he's repairing each section and speaking forth life to completely repair and restore the stones to live again. Amen. Now, these 53 Mishpatim, we find, are spoken here at Sinai in order for the covenant terms to be agreed to, but they also go along with the Ten Mitzvah, the Ten Commandments. We find the Ten Words are spoken, Israel must agree to them. And then these 53 Mishpatim are spoken, Israel must agree to them. Together, we find that 63 commands are given in this covenant-cutting ceremony. Well, 63 is also an interesting number. It's the value of the Hebrew word galal, which means to roll, to roll away, to remove something. It can indicate to roll stones, the ibn. Remember, the stones are gathered here. But it's quite interesting because cognates of this root stem galal can indicate either redemption and awakening. But on the opposite end, it can also mean to be exiled. Remember, there is a blessing and a curse for every aspect, for every word in the Hebrew language. And so as Israel stands here hearing these words, it seems to point that as these words are released, Israel's ability to hear and to respond is either going to cause them to be positioned, literally rolled into their proper place. Just like Ezekiel says, bone coming to bone, they're going to be put in their proper position as the Eben, the living stones, as they take on their redemption and are awakened, literally live again, or their rejection of this word will cause them to choose exile because they refuse to hear. And so we find that as Israel stands here hearing these words, these words were strategic. They were picked specifically, 63 commands for Israel to agree to, giving the indication that by their rejection, they choose exile again. By their agreement, they live. They no longer are dead. They live again. It's amazing to me because we talk about the miraculous that Yahweh does in the midst of the land of Egypt with the plagues that fall upon them. But how many realize that probably the greatest miracle in this whole Exodus journey was this mass resurrection of an entire nation as they stand, a dead nation, in the grave clothes, standing there at Sinai, live again with the release of these words. Amen. How many of us the same scenario is taking place now in our days? You're once again, the exiles are being gathered. The stones are being rolled into place. And we find that the word of Yahweh is being released to prophesy over these stones. And we find that the way the people respond will determine and seal them either for exile or for redemption. You will be marked for one or the other. And we find that those that are marked for redemption, no matter what's going to be taking place in the world, as the judgments of Yahweh are poured out, they're sealed, they're marked. That one is marked for redemption. That one will live again. Amen? We find that it seems that this could be a reason why there's such a push nowadays to compromise the very physical DNA of man. Why? The enemy is doing everything he can to prevent the sons and daughters from being born. And we find that it seems that this is why there's such an emphasis on your ability to hear. It's so important that you hear because the words that you hear, if it's the word of Yahweh, it has the ability to restore and repair you. Hence the greatest command, Shema Israel, hear, understand who your Elohim is. Why? Because this is what's going to cause you to be restored, repaired, and live again. Now, as we look at this in Exodus chapter 21, verse 1, is the start of this Torah portion. And as we said, it's 53 commandments, two chapters worth of commandments that seem to cover tons of different aspects. And it's quite interesting because when we read this, we'll read the opening verse. It says, now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. 
Well, the word judgment is where we get the title mishpatim. It's from the singular mishpat, Strong's number 4941. And it's translated as meaning judgment, justice, ordinance, an act of deciding a case, a lawful decision. So when we see these judgments, not only is it commandments being set before them, but this word as well infers a lawful decision is being made. In other words, Israel at this moment is being weighed in the balance. There's a court case taking place. And we find that Israel's response to the Mishpatim seems as if it's going to bring about a lawful decision, a decision that will stand and cannot be contested regarding their status as sons and daughters. How many realize the same thing is taking place now as the exiles are gathered? How can you prove that you're a son and a daughter? Well, we find that Yahweh is going to bring us to a place where there will be a decision made that will not be allowed to be questioned regarding your status as his son or his daughter. Amen? Now, as we look at this, the first set of Mishpatim seem to cause somewhat of a conundrum. Because with this type of foundation that seems to be being laid, how significant these are. Because remember, these commandments are being spoken from Mount Sinai by the voice of Yahweh. This is the covenant-cutting ceremony. He has chosen 53 specific commands for Israel to agree to. And yet, instead of laws regarding holiness or something easily seen as dealing with our relationship with the Creator, if you've read it, you know it immediately goes into laws regarding servanthood or slavery. And it almost makes you, once again, the brakes come to a screeching halt. What does this have to do with our status as sons and daughters? What does this have to do with these stones living again? We just came out of slavery. We just came out of bondage. Why is this the focus? And it's quite interesting because, as we've said, Israel has just been set free from bondage. It was called avodah. It's the same root as this word used here regarding a servant, a Hebrew servant that would be sold and then set free, an eved. And we find that Israel, in theory, they're free, right? They've been set free from Egypt. They're here at the mountain. They're free. Why is the focus on commandments regarding slavery or servants? In Exodus chapter 21, verse 2, we read, If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. But in 5 and 6, we find that sometimes there's a situation where that servant will choose to stay. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Well, let's look at this word for servant. It's Strong's number 5650, Eved, and it means slave or servant. But you have to understand the same term is used for worship as well. It's used to describe the priestly duties in the tabernacle. It's a term that can be used to describe when Adam leaves the garden, he must till the ground. It's a term that is used to describe anything that you're going to put your hand to. Any type of work that you're going to do, it's eved. It comes from that root word avad, to work, to serve, to labor. But it's quite interesting because when you break apart this term eved, it's spelled ayin bait dalet. The iron bait root forms a two-letter root in Hebrew, Strong's number 5646. It's an architectural term referring to the plank or beam that forms a threshold. This root is connected to the letter dalet, which means a door. So when you see this term avad, the literal Hebrew pictographic language reveals that it's dealing with the threshold of a doorway. And we understand that to cross the threshold indicates a covenant has been cut. Now, remember, Israel was eved. They were slaves in Egypt as well. And so it seems to indicate that in that servanthood, in that slavery in Egypt, a threshold was crossed in order for them to be placed into bondage. Now, as we look at this, it seems that these introductory mishpatim then have a deeper meaning hidden within something's taking place here. There's a reason he chooses to address this specifically first. We find that not only are these instructions that would structure the society of Israel, ensuring that they never became a nation steeped in bondage, 
How many of you realize that should be a key indicator that all the nations of the world, including the nation of the free, is a nation steeped in bondage? But Israel, the people of Yahweh, were not to be a nation steeped in bondage. But we find also it reveals not only more aspects of the covenant being offered to them now, but it also seems to be pointing towards something that they've been redeemed from. So we have to ask the question, how? Well, we understand that Israel's been brought here to Sinai in order to enter into a covenant. This is the Sefer Habrit. This is literally the book of the covenant. It's the covenant cutting ceremony. And it's by crossing the threshold that they enter into this threshold covenant with the king of all creation. And how many realize that in ancient traditions that when you would cross the threshold into a home, you've now become part of the family. In other words, if Israel chooses to step across this threshold, they're becoming sons and daughters when they enter into this covenant with Yahweh. And yet it seems as if it's reminding them they've just exited, though, a house. They've just come out of the house of another, Pharaoh, having served, having avad, having crossed a threshold with him as well. And it's interesting because the term avad can even mean worshiped, having looked to him as their source, having looked to them, to Pharaoh as the one that was their sustainer. And we find they've arrived at Mount Sinai, which is literally the place of the threshold coinciding with Shavuot. It's interesting because Shavuot is seven weeks from celebrating and being freed upon Passover. And it seems that now as they approach this threshold before they are welcomed across, Yahweh begins to point out some very strategic and specific things. Some choices must be made and they must have a clear understanding before they cross this threshold, before they enter into his house. Now, it's quite interesting because this number seven, remember, it's been seven weeks since they've been set free, and now they have arrived at Sinai, that the season of the slaves or servants being released also revolves around the number seven. For six years, they serve, but the seventh year is when they go free. And we find this seven-week season of counting the Omer to Shavuot is a pattern as well of the seventh year sabbatical, which also dealt with a releasing of slaves and debts, the Shemitah year. And it also seems to be pictured in the weekly Shabbat, a day of release. Once again, you have these patterns continuously. Six, you serve. Six, you work. But the seventh, there's something about being set free. There's something about being released. And here we find that Israel has arrived in the seventh week. It's the time of their freedom. It's the time to be released, to be set free. So we have to ask the question, could it be that it was not about Israel physically exiting Egypt that would set them free, but the decision they make right here in this moment when presented with this covenant, now is when they will be be declared free. Free.